This is The Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. With your host, Tyson Gifford and William Rowick. Episode 139, recorded January 4th, 2018. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. I am your host, Tyson Gifford, and joining me today, as always, is my partner in crime, William Rorick. Hello. So it's been two weeks. We've been off the air because of holidays, but we are back, and we are back today in particular to discuss the year in TV 2017. So we have kind of a list of, you know, different categories, and we're going to pick our winners, each of us separately, and but also kind of just talk about some other stuff that fits into that category that kind of deserves some recognition. And that's kind of all we're going to be talking about in this episode. We're not going to be running down any episodes. If you're into more of that side of things with our podcast, um, next week we're going to begin discussing three separate shows. So it's quite a bit, actually. We're going to be talking about Black Mirror. We're going to be talking about The Magicians. And we are going to be talking about Peaky Blinders. So The Magicians isn't out yet. It comes out the day before we record our podcast, but we got screeners, so we're going to be caught up and releasing them right on time. And Black Mirror and Peaky Blinders are both already available on Netflix. So you can check those out. They dropped the full seasons for those. So you can watch those and watch the whole seasons if you want, or you could watch along with us as we talk about each episode. Will and I have both. uh, Will, you watched all but one of the Black Mirror episodes? Yep, I still got uh, Black Museum to watch. I just finished that one. I was actually going to watch it today, but I didn't get around to it, so. (laughs) I, I just finished all of them. So I just finished that one in particular today, but we're not going to be talking about those episodes except for where they might play into <laughs> and they, the awards we're talking about here. They, they landed on Netflix at the very end of 2017, making them eligible for the awards. And that's another thing we got to bring up right off the bat is that this has been more so than ever, and by a magnitude greater, a insanely packed year of television. This has this, been. <laughs> and, and it's getting, it's getting, I, I, it's hard. I was just about to say worse, but it's not necessarily worse. It's a good thing in many ways, you know, because it just means there's just such a huge amount of great content out. You know, if you're watching and you're like, man, this kind of show, this show kind of sucks right now. I wish I didn't have to watch that. Well, guess what? You don't because there's so much it, on it. You could literally just be as finicky, you know, as, as uh, finicky as you want and just choose whatever you want, as fickle as you want. And again, the, uh, the, the breadth of content is just because you're getting more players into the the serialized content space, you know, Netflix. Netflix it's, is the big one. <laughs> Netflix, is, Netflix is getting more and more aggressive. Yeah. Um, I totally Apple's forgot. Apple's getting into it now, Amazon. <laughs> See, I try to remember everything. I totally forgot about Punisher when I was making my list. So it, it doesn't make my list. There were like a few categories that I was considering it, but I don't. Yeah. I honestly don't think it's in the same league is most of the shows we're going to be talking about here. That's true. It, Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, yeah, it's hard to say it would have made my list anyway, but... There are a few categories that, that like, it ca- kind of came close in, but when I look at the winner, I'm like, no, it wouldn't have even touched the winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, 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 did, so, so that should tell you right off the bat, like, there, there is so much stuff. There, there are shows that are even amazing I, shows that we just haven't seen. That Yeah, there are shows that, yeah, like, there are shows that made Tyson's list that I just didn't watch last year. And, and then there are shows like The Handmaid's Tale, which is basically winning all the awards right now. That neither of I us watched. I haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah. It's... So, like, <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Handmaid's Tale didn't make our list, and you know, you really love that show. That's great. I haven't seen it, so I can't tell you anything about it. So we're not going to get, we're not going to award <laughs> it categories based on popular opinion when we haven't even seen it. Right, exactly. This, <laughs> so this is based. These lists are basically based off what we personally personally watched in 2017. So we had to limit ourselves to what we've seen, and we we do go out of our way to watch 
as much as we can, but there's just so much of it being produced these days that it, that's impossible. Yeah, you just you can't watch it all. You have to watch yeah. as much as you can. In the in the days leading up to recording this podcast, I was like cramming in. Like I watched all of Mine Hunter. I watched Black Mirror. I started watching Dark. I started watching some more Jean Claude Van Johnson. Like I was cramming in as much as I possibly. I was could. cramming in. I knew because Black Mirror hit at the end. I was trying to watch my. I was trying to watch all of Black Mirror before I sat down to write this list because I wanted to include that in in, in consideration and to do that. You I know, it's, it's a certain caliber of a show. Right, right. I know it's a certain caliber of a show. So, so I tried to watch as much of Black Mirror as I could before I sat down and wrote the list. Um, and it does make my list. You will find <laughs> you will find that out. <laughs> Made mine as well. Uh, a last minute change in addition, but uh, we're, we're going to go over all of that. We're going to start off right now with our first category, which is best technical production. So this is basically a show that is on a technical level is pushing pushing that that the envelope it is is moving things forward in a way that that just kind of goes beyond what we're used to seeing on TV. And, and and this is important because as shows the budgets have exploded, the so of the production values. And my pick for that, of course, for me, is going to be Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones year over year has just been getting more insane with its production values. This year, the, the number of just battles they had, the amount of CG they used, it was oh, just well, you know, they, insane. They had uh, just just the just one episode there where you had <laughs> Daenerys and her dragons and the White Walkers. You know, all of that is special effects like that. How how because because they had like all those White Walkers and then they had the two dragons. Dragons. How, how much could that? That's got to be expensive as hell. That's like on the amount of like practical effects. Like they built an entire fake frozen lake. Yeah, that they filmed on for that same episode, and and they film even even besides that, they film their location shooting is all over the world, and that goes into the production as well. You know, that's that's part of the production. So Game of Thrones is just <laughs> insane. You had I, a different pick, I think. Mainly I, had, I picked Game of Thrones. I had a different pick mainly because I think we picked Game of Thrones for this like every year and yeah. it's, it's it's certainly justified i can't argue against that but i i just i just felt so cliche to always pick game of thrones for this category. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's hard because it's like <laughs> it's, it's almost like just you know I, I think next year we should just call it the annual best technical yeah. production brought to you by game of thrones Award. oh we can't we can't <laughs> next year because uh game of thrones won't be eligible it's not airing in 2018 that, that's all you can do brought to you by game of thrones <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to be Westworld. Yeah, you're you're gonna have to finally pick something else next year for that <laughs> category. That's probably gonna stress you out. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can I still pick last season of Game of Thrones? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pick, pick that again, yeah. <laughs> but you had a different pick. Tell us what your pick I had, uh Mine was The Expanse, and I think, other than Game of Thrones, I think this this probably had the most technical production because because it's, it's a space opera, you know? It's, it takes place in space, and that requires all kinds of special effects to do the ships, to do all that a stuff. A lot of detail, too. A lot of detail show. is in that show exactly it's like heavily detailed um you know you you can tell that sci-fi put in some money for that show it, it yeah. shows um and there's I some think, passionate people working on that stuff too i think technically it's at least on the sci-fi channel it's probably the most technically uh you know sound show on that entire network i think yeah i'd agree definitely uh, so, so yeah so i give the nod to the expanse <laughs> You know, out other than Game of Thrones, because <laughs> we, we could, because it, pretending Game of Thrones doesn't exist, I give it to the Expanse. <laughs> so I picked another um, runner-up as well, um, just to kind of bring up for something that's like evolved on a technical level, I think, and that's Mr. Robot. Mr. Which Robot, is... another show I forgot about in my considerations. Damn it, and that had some <laughs> really that's some really good stuff this year too. Don't worry, I got it covered. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Robot, it, it I think even more so than before on a technical level, they really stepped it up um, this season. They did they did an episode that was shot as if it was one shot, and they did like some incredibly interesting things. Use of like minimal amounts of CG and mat 
artwork in order to like do things like having the camera go up into the rafters of a building, pull up as a character goes all the way to the wall, and then showing both the inside and outside of a building. Right. It's like that that's done using CG and composition. That it, was it's, really cool. it's high level. That is high level. Yeah, that was really cool, I thought. Yeah. I was, like, I was in awe. It was Especially, seamless. That's the thing. Yeah, you know? that's and, seamless. And so it's it's really impressive. That's but that's the other one I kind of really wanted to bring up on the technical production side. But if we're going to be talking about technical production, we have the other hand at play, which is the artistic production. Mm, um, yes. So in this, we're talking about like art direction. We're talking about, you know, the, the sheer artistry of a, a show. So let, let's pick up with your yours first here, which is Legion. Okay. Yeah, Legion, which really from... Well, Legion impressed me on all levels, but really it, it impressed me from a visual artistic level like like it's so it's so surreal at times right and especially when you got those moments where you're inside legion's head and he sees like the the evil manifestation who like kind of shows up as like some cartoon cartoon evil guy or something and then shit turns red and you know (laughs) there's a lot with color there's a lot with color there's a lot with color um it's just got this uh a lot of it has like this sort of retro 60s vibe and it, it very it's hard to explain but it's like very surrealistic almost almost impressionistic a yeah. lot you know like like it it's a lot of the show it plays out like an acid trip <laughs> that, that's a good way of putting it there's also a lot of use of like animation in interesting ways in particular yeah. there, there's a scene where a different version of him in his head is explaining the situ the current situation of his life yes. to him using blackboard Using blackboards. And, and, and it's, it's animated yeah, on the chalk. It looks flawless. That was really cool. I was really impressed. Just from an artistic standpoint, I was impressed with this show. So, yeah, I mean, great performances. There's some cool, like, like you mentioned, it has this kind of like 60s, I'd say 60s slash 70s, slash 70s kind of aesthetic to it. Yeah. And, and that plays into more than just like the atmosphere on the set, like the way things look on the set, but it also plays into like, there's like some musical kind of montage like moments and stuff that feel very 70s and really like they, they kind of draw things out. There's like a whole section of, of like an episode. It's like half an episode, I think, that's silent. Mm, yes. And, and it's like a silent film title cards and stuff it, it's just brilliant yeah it's just brilliant it's it's some next level stuff <laughs> in my opinion <laughs> so uh, my I don't, choice I, I don't think there was anything since hannibal that impressed me artistically on that level setting me up for the segue <laughs> yeah my choice for best artistic production is american gods <laughs> um, which comes from brian fuller the showrunner of hannibal um also michael green who has had a lot of movie work this year besides uh American Gods. But there are a lot of things in this. I mean, well, right off the bat, it, it's Brian Four again, working with David Slade, um, who, uh-huh. by the way, also did um, the episode of Black Mirror Metalhead, the black and white episode. Yep. And David <laughs> Slade also did some of the best episodes of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, I think I'm really starting to like David Slade uh, <laughs> and his work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Dave, David Slade um, kind of established a lot of the visual style of American Gods from like a hilarious, like, ultra violent story that started off the, the very first episode of like Vikings arriving in America um, with just this kind of like level of absurdity with like slow motion blood and just the amount of arrows that would get fired into somebody and things like that that are just kind of preposterous but just look perfect and, and beautiful but also one trick that he pulled in the series that I thought like I don't think I've ever seen a show do it this well is they shot at like a very very high shutter speed which makes things look a little bit jarring and it gives it like this hyper realistic look mm, yes. where like you know whenever you see like rain for example like you can see every raindrop there's no like blur yeah, <laughs> yeah that was and, and it just gives it this insane look yeah i really i really like that uh yeah i again like american gods was fantastic in the art department it reminded I th- I, th- I think it reminded me a lot of Hannibal in that in that way. It was very similar to how Hannibal was pre- presented and if Legion didn't exist, it, it probably would have been American Gods probably would have been my pick as well. Easily my runner up. Um, just because, yeah, again, it, it is impressive from an artistic standpoint. 
I think I think if I had any complaints about American Gods, it would be it it felt too similar to Hannibal. Yeah. In that in that way. Uh, yeah, so, definitely. So, so like there, it, there, it, it does it, have that oily look that like Hannibal does. Right. Yeah, it does. Which I guess maybe is like uh, Brian Fuller's signature now or something. But <laughs> or David Slade's. <laughs> David Slade's. Yeah. Because uh, uh, that, that episode of uh, that black and white episode of Black Mirror also is kind of oily. That's true. You're right. So yeah, but no, American Gods is gorgeous. Even if you're not interested in the story, you could still like visually, you could still enjoy it visually from an artistic standpoint. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you there. That's all, that's also a fantastic choice for that category. There were a lot of other good shows like in this category that like made it a bit of a fight as well, though. You know, I mean, I put I would on, say, on uh, as a runner up Stranger Things too. I would say, um, uh, Mr. Robot is a good runner up. Mr. For that. Robot's always good on that side definitely taboo yeah. this year and i was seriously debating giving it to twin peaks but i ended up giving the reason i was going to give that to twin peaks i ended up putting in a different category instead because i really just i think it's one of the most important things to talk about this year when it comes to just the craziness of television filmmaking you know oh yeah yeah you're right you're right um but i just i moved that to a different category but it, but it wouldn't be right not to mention what what that did on on an artistic front you know um but yeah i mean there's just a lot it's it's been good i mean even on the comedy side stuff like the good place has a really strong art direction yeah um, yeah so it's, it's very it's bright killing it. everyone seems to be killing it in this in this area right now it, it was a, it was a difficult it was a difficult uh category to award but you know definitely def- yeah pe- people are killing it it's hard a, a lot of these were hard to actually award <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like sometimes you pick you have one and you're like that's my pick and then you like kind of look back and you're like oh yeah and it's not because the thing that you picked isn't doesn't you know have the confidence for it it's, it's just that there's so much else that's just at that same caliber exactly exactly so our next category is writing so i'll, I'll start off with my pick which is the leftovers uh, it ran for its its third and final season. Um, it, it, it was its concluding season. There's something kind of special about when a show is ending on its own terms. Right. Like this show could have gone longer. That does not happen often. Yeah. And and, and they're ending it exactly on terms. And, and three seasons is not a long run. Um, and it wasn't like HBO said, oh, okay, we'll give you one more season. It was Damon Lindelof. It's like, we only got one more season. Oh, and right. HBO's like, okay, sure. So The Leftovers is just so focused in its final season season and and it finds so many new ways of exploring you know its subject matter it's a just a great show but what it's so masterful at in its writing is is uh uh, um audience contempt or like taking like audience expectations and like turning them on their head um and that's one of the things that the leftovers is great at it's something that damon lindelof is great at when he did lost you know um but on the leftovers there's just kind of like it's got a shorter season so it's a little bit tighter and more focused because of that and it's hb so it's got that that strength behind it. Plus, there's a pretty decent gap between the second and third season, so they had some time in in their production to film. They filmed it mostly in Australia, but you know that's going getting kind of off board here on the writing. It, it's the writing was so good. There's so many great like character monologues in the season where a character would be trying to explain something to somebody, and they'd go into like a story and use it as an example, and it was just awesomely written. Including like in the final episode, they give like this explanation that. They basically answers every question that fans have. And this is what Damon Lindelof said that he was not going to do. He said, like, we're not going to answer the questions. That's not what the show's about. Because basically the show's about a bunch of people disappearing in a rapture-like event. And right up front, Damon Lindelof's like, we're not going to answer, like, where these people went, what happened or something. But they do. But the tricky thing about how they did it is that when it ends, when the discussion's over, and they explain everything in a very satisfactory way, by the way. And they they do it all just just through, through dialogue. It's just a character talking, no cutaways, nothing. Just a character talking, explaining the whole story. And it's captivating from beginning to end, but you don't know if it's true or not. Okay. You don't know if 
if this character is lying or not. Right. That's and true. and they don't and they don't make it easy to think like, oh yeah, yeah, for sure she's lying, or oh no, she's not lying at all. I think most people have come to the conclusion that she's lying, hmm. just because it seems like the better ending. That she, if she's lying, it seems like the better way to do it. You know, to to right. end a series like that um, without showing anything. But you, you don't know either way, and it, and it made it like a really captivating speech, basically, or a monologue that this character had. Right. Definitely. So uh, that's, that's the leftovers. Another one I, that I just finished recently that I thought kind of fit in there would be like Mine Hunter. But I'm not going to talk too much about that. It's David Fincher directed it, and it's really good on Netflix. I haven't watched either, so, so <laughs> not surprisingly, either neither of those are my pick. Uh, oh, you didn't just give it to it, anyways. <laughs> I, I, I gave the hands made tail of my words. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Uh, but my pick was Legion. Uh, Legion was really something special uh this year uh there there are a lot of superhero shows on tv there are a lot of shows based on comic books marvel comics uh especially and they're 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 good they're all right um i enjoy them legion is such a good superhero <laughs> show that it's like almost, like i never even count it when i name superhero shows right because it doesn't <laughs> Like you don't even feel think like of one because it's on such another level. It's on, so, yeah, exactly. It's on. This is a complete the other level because it it takes it takes the basic framework right because the X Men is always like mutants versus the government and it kind of starts out like that a little but then it just takes a takes a hard swerve and if I it, it's not about that at all. Sure, sure. There are these. Pe- there's this government agency, you know, trying trying to hunt down Legion and and the others. But it's more about like this battle that Legion is having with this entity living in his brain. Because oh, yeah, um, all the external threats aren't even like legitimate threats. Yeah, they're not even legitimate threats. They're lies, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 the external threats are lies. So, so the real antagonist is is this powerful entity that it's kind of co inhabited Inhabiting Legion's mind and brilliantly uh, portrayed by Aubrey Plaza, by the way. She was fantastic in this. I have her as a runner up on another category coming out. <laughs> nice. And, and I just thought, and, and, and because of, and, and because of like the situation, because it's like all mental, um, it allows them to do some really interesting stuff writing wise. Like you already mentioned the scene where he's talking to himself and he's explaining to himself the situation and drawing cartoon animations on a chalkboard. And the, <laughs> the British version of himself. The British version of himself. It allows, it allows them to do things like that. It allows them to do like, like swerves, like you don't know. Like it, it allows them to do stuff like, uh, you don't know what's real, what's actually happening. Like we open, he's in a, he's in a mental hospital, but is he, did that happen? Is that real? Uh, it's been a big trend of the last few years, the unreliable narrator. It's been a big trend. Yeah, it has been. So, so, you know, it lets them do some really cool and, and the way Noah Hawley spins it, you know, it's, it's just pure magic. And, and it's become, it's become like my favorite, my favorite Marvel show, my favorite superhero show of all time, right off yeah. the bat. I, I think it's the best one. It's um, hard for me to even consider it one. Just it, like yeah. it doesn't compute in my head. <laughs> right, right, exactly. It doesn't compute. It, yeah, exactly. It doesn't compute. It's hard for me to consider it. It's not even on that level. Yeah, like you know, I think Legion and I think, you know, com- com- on, on a comparative level, I think <laughs> Game of Thrones, Mr. Robot, you know, stuff like that. I don't think like, Agents of Shield, The Flash, you know, like it's on such a higher plane than those. Right. This is uh to to me to me and this this might be repetitive, but to me this is a work of art. Um, Definitely. And you got to give it to Noah Hawley for for running both Legion and season three of Fargo, and yeah. neither one with a drop in quality. And neither one, yeah, that is pretty amazing. You know, you would think something would have to give there, but I guess this man is just has that much creativity inside of him. <laughs> <laughs> 
Like, like I, I, I think Noah Hawley might be the new Brian Fuller. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's one of those showrunners. He's, he's the one that kind of popped up and became huge, you know? There's a few other figures. There's a, a few new hot shot showrunners. Sam S. Mel from Mr. Robot being another one. Yeah. Um, that are like these auteurs that we just, we need to like protect <laughs> with everything. Protect. <laughs> with everything we have. Because these are our TV t shirts. <laughs> exactly. Because these, these are, these are the people making the real groundbreaking television programs. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah. So Legion is my pick for best writing. I just really enjoyed that show. If you can't tell by now. <laughs> so our next category is best performer. So we decided to, instead of having a best actress, best actor, best supporting actor, best guest actress, best, you know, use of a hand model in a scene about World War Three. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 to so honest, ridiculous things. and to be honest, there are enough awards here. I don't want to have to go through that. Yeah. Instead of all those ridiculous levels of categories, we, we kind of grouped that together into one, which is best performer. And so this is a unisex portrayal. So this, this means it could be a, a male. It could be a female. It could be a, a transgender. It, it could be anything. It's just a performance. And, it, and the performance could be five minutes long it in the be, entire run of the series, it or be, it could be the main star of the show. Right. It could be any performance former who who performed in a serialized program in 2017 exactly your pick to start things off is ian mcshane for american gods look i mean come on mr wednesday Wednesday. and he plays it such pitch perfection i mean right off the bat you know like like he portrays mr wednesday as as on the surface this sleazy con man you know this 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 guy that you are instantly suspicious of with an easy charm yeah an oily charm he's with, just he's yeah with an <laughs> oily charm you know um you, you know right off the bat uh, what's the guy's name that he takes in i forgot shadow the main, the main character's name shadow, shadow moon shadow moon that's it yeah like like immediately shadow moon is put off by this guy is is suspicious and put off by this guy right um so so, so that's him, but then underneath that, because that's a, that's a veneer mm-hmm. that he uses underneath that. He's this powerful, you know, ancient entity, you know, and, and, and so really the, the, the skeezy con man is like, it, it, that's his mask, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's his way of, that's his, his way of hiding his true nature. Disarming others. Yeah. Just in disarming others. Yeah. And it, it works really well. And, uh, you know, that, that's a hard thing to pull off, but Ian McShane does it brilliantly. Like, do you remember when they announced, started announcing the cast for American Gods? I remember. I just like insane that was. <laughs> that was insane. Yeah. I mean, when they announced the cast, I knew, I knew there was going to be perf- good performances because these are, these are good actors. But Ian McShane is a great actor. You know, anybody who's watched Deadwood can yeah. attest to that. Right. So there was no way he wasn't going to be good in this role unless he just phoned it in which thankfully he doesn't and i think uh ian mcshane's odin is going to go down as just as memorable as his character in deadwood um, as, as Al Swearingen and Deadwood, yeah. Yeah, I think I so. I can see that. It, it really, it works for Ian McShane to play this character, this huckster that's just got this gravitas that's below that surface. Right. It, like, it, it fits him as an actor and he, and he, and he does it brilliantly. He does it exactly as you'd expect. And that's a, an amazing thing. My, my pick for best performer goes to Carrie Coon. Um, she had two big roles this season. She was in Fargo season three, but the, the one I'm going to give it to her for is the leftovers where she played Nora. Okay. Um, so Nora is kind of like one of the central protagonists, one of the two main central protagonists of the leftovers from season one. And in season three, it's kind of starting to shift more and more towards her and, and her journey and where things are. And she's, she's always had this kind of harrowing journey through the series because she's somebody that lost her entire family in this rapture like event her husband and her children all of them disappeared and and left her with nothing and so she's been like she's had this very strange relationship with the people that you know do scams related to you know the the um the people that the 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 people that disappeared you know to try to scam families and the people that are you know so hopeful that you know there's going to be like an anniversary of the event is coming up so everyone 
everyone's going to return and the people that freak out about that and just her relationship to all of that. The parts of her that are skeptical, the parts of her that believe are, are like in direct contrast with each other. And it makes her like just a really fascinating character and somebody who's just like very troubled because she's, she's, she's so angry, but she's also like so vulnerable at the same time. Yeah. And uh, Carrie Coon just nailed it, just knocked it out of the park. I think in, in many like TV fandom circles, she, she, her name has become like a household name after, after this performance. And, uh, yeah. So welcome Carrie Coon to the Legion of well-known TV actors. Nice. You're now one of them. <laughs> Yeah, so next up, we have Best Ensemble Cast. So this is a, a cast together, a large group of people um, in in a series. You know, like a good example of this would be like like Lost had like a huge ensemble cast. Right. So this, this could be a show that also has a strong protagonist and stuff, but where the focus of the show is on these this group of this cast working together as an ensemble piece. So that, that's what this category is about. So my pick for Best Ensemble Cast is American God. Um, I, I avoided giving Ian McShane best performer because I knew I was going to give American Gods ensemble cast. And I wanted to kind of uh, uh, open up the category to other people as well on that. So that's what I picked, which is American Gods. A great ensemble cast. The, the lead is probably the weakest figure, and he's still super strong. <laughs> right. And right. then you take in Ian McShane as Mr. Wednesday, Crispin Glover as Mr. World, oh, um, I Gillian agree. Anderson. I, I mean, just it just keeps going on and on. It's just amazing performers the acting show, off of each other. The show is full of amazing performances. Which, oh yeah. You, know, you you again when they announced the cast, you you <laughs> you, you knew that it, you knew that they. Were, it was going to be either either a bunch of amazing performances or or you know or a disaster. It was not going to be anything in between with these actors because they're such good actors. It's last last year when we were talking about this category, I picked um, Westworld. Right, and, and it and, was the same deal. Yeah, yeah. same deal, amazing. And it's like you think like, man, this is like a once in a lifetime cast where you get this this kind of talent together, and then the next year it happens again. <laughs> completely different show it's amazing it is amazing definitely great um i picked the good place because this show this show is basically the plot of the show is its ensemble cast yeah right i mean the whole basis of the show is that these people are brought together to spoiler alert torture each other for eternity and to that and and leading to wildly comedic results and i think and and I think it works so perfectly because the cast does work so well together. They do bounce off of each other so well. Everybody everybody in the cast has their own quirks and the actors uh the actors for their part all play their characters perfectly. Um all play their characters perfectly. You get to you you come to love each one of them, although I I think most people end up hating the really stupid guy. <laughs> I, I love him. I love, I, love, I love Jason. I love Jason too. I've talked, I've, I've talked to some people just thought, oh, who just hate that guy? And I'm like, oh, okay. But <laughs> because, because he's such a lovable Jason. moron. <laughs> he's such a lovable moron. Exactly. And again, that's like the point. He's a more, he's, he's, he's placed there because his, his stupidity is supposed to annoy and torture the other people. Again, like, because the whole premise is Michael, the demon who Ted Danson also amazing as part of this ensemble because even though he's a part of the group in the second season he becomes part of the group and adds to the dynamic in a really funny way um <laughs> but like besides but, him you also have uh, uh the robot um joy yeah the robot, joy? uh janet janet that's it um you have janet as, as this like figure that basically is there to answer their questions and get them whatever they need and again like like more antics ensue and Jason like marries her. <laughs> <laughs> one of the funniest uh, moments in the show actually <laughs> because when Jason marries her and he's like talking to Ted Danson and Ted Danson is incredulous <laughs> at, 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 like the whole reality of that happening 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, oh man. Uh, yeah. But literally, if this ensemble cast didn't work together, the entire show would not work. Oh yeah, definitely. This is an example of, of character chemistry working perfectly. Right. This is an example. So I have to give it to the good place for this because yeah, they nailed it. <laughs> Our next category is best showrunner, and you and I agreed on this one. Noah Hawley, who did both Legion and Fargo, and we had already kind of t- touched on this that he did both Legion and Fargo, both next level shows. He we put out both, both shows this out. year. <laughs> who? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. How could it not be Noah Hawley, right? Because who? Who else this year put out two shows, uh, two top tier shows? Yeah, who? nobody. <laughs> yeah, nobody did. Nobody did. <laughs> Great <laughs> Berlanti. <laughs> yeah, Greg Berlanti. Uh, he, he, Greg Berlanti put out five shows. You're right. Damn. <laughs> no. The, the thing though is uh, not top tier. <laughs> yeah, not tier exactly. And that Noah. No, it's definitely Noah Holly. I don't think we need to belabor the fact. Um, watch Fargo. Watch Legion. I've already talked at length about Legion. We haven't talked much about Fargo, if you want to talk about that, but... Well, I, just to say that Fargo Season 3 continued to be great, continued to draw from, like, not just what the Coen Brothers did with the Fargo movie, but, like, the entire library of the Coen Brothers films. There's, like, some great references to, like, the Big Lebowski and uses of kind of, like, the mythological elements of that, like, tied into it. Great performances throughout. I, I have another person coming up in a category that was in uh, Fargo as well. Um, um, but yeah, just just great. Fargo mm. was just great. Season three was great. And, and it's hard to imagine where they would go after season two, because season two kind of went back in time and kind of focused on like the father of the central character of season right. one. And season three is kind of is mostly unrelated. There's a few connections, but it's mostly you kind unrelated. You expect it to get worse, right? Because you, you kind of expect to be like, well, with a show like that, you can't expect, okay, this was amazing, but they, they can't keep this up, right? That's, come on. Oh, and they, they hit in so many <laughs> interesting areas. They 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 just they just approached certain things so well in, in this season. Um, they kind of went on this whole like you know the the main character went on a trek to uh, Los Angeles to explore like the background of her father in law and, and 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 you know it's like all this kind of stuff just fascinating. And, and and then you get like the main plot of of the story and the way that feeds together and the way it ties up and ends. Probably the most satisfying ending of a season of Fargo because Fargo has kind of had like a little slight inconsistent endings mm-hmm. and, and that's sure. been by design like you know it's been meant to be ambiguous endings but and, and season three is still a, a ambiguous ending but it's probably the best of the endings of the three seasons oh nice um so yeah it's just nailed it the fact that he did this at the same time as he was doing legion is just crazy that's crazy yeah <laughs> you, you expect you expect the quality to be, slip on one of those but but no <laughs> so next up we have best protagonist um, so this is the the lead character of the story. Um, I'm gonna let you go first here. Okay, this is hard because so many good protagonists. Obviously, I tried not to repeat myself too much with these awards. Mm-hmm. So like. So since I gave like Ian McShane best performance, I wasn't, eh, you know, I wasn't like going to give him best protagonist. Then again, he's not really a protagonist. I don't know. Just kidding. <laughs> but no, but my pick was uh, James Delaney from Taboo. Um, played by Tom Hardy. Yeah. Played by Tom Hardy. Uh, you know, at his Tom Hardiest, you know, he's just a, a very interesting character to me. He's intimidating. Uh, he is intimidating. Um, he's kind, he's kind of weird. Because you know he's he's kind of he's into that voodoo shit, right? Yeah, he's witchy. Uh, he's witchy. <laughs> he, he's witchy. Uh, I I really like him. He's got because, an awesome hat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's got an awesome hat too, right? He really rocks that top hat. Uh, <laughs> I really like him because he he he's he's a he he's a take no shit type character. In, in a world where, in a world of like these snooty people who like to give people shit, expect to give, get away with it. 
But the thing is, he's like... got that perfect combination of the fact that he is, he is a physical threat. Right. He, he is like a serious, like in, in every shot that he's in, he's the most dangerous person in that shot. Oh, yeah. He um, is. Like on a physical level. And then on top of that, he's highly intelligent. Right. He is hi- highly intelligent on top of that. And he so, does not suffer fools. <laughs> he does not suffer fools. So, 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 you know, so, so my favorite scenes in Taboo are the part where, you know, where, where people People are trying to to give him shit, and and he just throws it back in their face yeah. um, in such an awesome manner. Uh, you know, like so, sometimes with violence, and sometimes without even having to resort to it. It's amazing. Some, sometimes, yeah, sometimes just just by being imposing, uh, and it's pretty amazing. And I really love that. Like, it just he's just an awesome character. Yeah, oh, love that. Love that. I mean, yeah, James my, Delaney just awesome. My winner went to Kyle McLaughlin as Agent. Dale Cooper slash Dougie Jones <laughs> in Twin Peaks Returns. That's that that's a good choice. Although I I I, I have a hard time justifying that just because Dougie Jones was basically brain dead and Dale Cooper <laughs> was and Dale Cooper was in the entire series for a total of like maybe ten minutes. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> but hey, <laughs> Dougie Jones, Dougie Jones beat out a pedophile in a in a government race. <laughs> That's true. That's true. You're right. <laughs> Dougie Jones took down Roy Moore <laughs> in Alabama. He did. Dougie <laughs> Jones, like I, t- I told you, Twin Peaks. That's a, that's a prophecy straight from David Lynch. He saw the future and he wrote it down into a new season of Twin Peaks. He left. Cooper had such a small season. role in this season of Twin Peaks in this in this return. Right. I mean, the whole show was about him basically, but like it took so long before he came back, and the anticipation was just. It was like people. The second to last episode, he came back, and <laughs> yeah. it was like a, at the end of that episode. So, <laughs> yeah. and and yeah, so he finally came back, and the moment he came back, the transformation between Dougie to Dale Cooper was like instantly recognizable without even a word spoken. Right. Just the way he carried himself, the look in his face and his eyes, everything. And the second he like started, you know, his quippy fast dialogue and giving his thumbs up, it was like all felt right in the world after many. Many very dark and disturbing episodes. I, you know, I, I think that speaks totally to the performance by oh my Kyle god, McLaughlin. Kyle McLaughlin. You know, and and now I'm regretting not giving him best performer because he certainly <laughs> deserves that. For twenty, years, he was right? he was in my in my consideration for that too. Yeah, definitely. Right, because the way he because because the way he goes from Dougie Jones to Dale Cooper to evil Dale Cooper. Yeah, like like he he played three vastly different roles in this, and and he was perfect in each of them. Like <laughs> like that's that's pretty damn impressive. Um, yeah, he was it was it was a hard choice for me to pick, but I decided I wanted him as my best protagonist. Right, gotcha. That makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, but the only reason I did pick him as best protagonist is because because of reasons I cited that, yeah. like I considered Dougie Jones, and I'm like, mm, he was basically brain dead. I don't know if if I can. <laughs> Hello. Oh, that was that was, that was my favorite scene from the enti- entirety of Twin Peaks season three. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if you're going to have a best protagonist, you're going to need the best antagonist. Mm, definitely. So I'll kick things off. My choice is David Thewlis, who played Varga in Fargo season three. Oh, okay. Fargo villains have always been good all three seasons. I I didn't think it was possible that season one's villain uh, Marlo is is portrayed by Billy Bob Thornton could be kind of bested in, in like creepy fashion. Right. But he was, he was in season pretty, three. Oh wow, that's pretty that's David Thewlis's Varga is just filthy. There's just something about him that just turns your stomach whenever he's on screen. Just the way he kind of picks at his teeth and the way he is his his cold eyes. It's just he's so like just ruthless and cruel and, and there's just something to him that's just I, I don't know. It's just it's kind of like nauseating. And it's it's hard to say that because it's like you're saying that about David Thewlis, but that's not the case. It's the way he portrayed this character, mm. and it's it's just amazing. My pick was uh, Michael from The Good Place, and this is an interesting pick because you go through the entire if if you haven't finished season one of The Good Place, 
you you wouldn't call him an antagonist, right? Why why would I pick him? That's that's weird, right? No, watch watch the last watch the finale of season <laughs> one, and you will find out why I picked him. Because Which, when, even though we're on season two of the Good Place now, season one ended in 2017. Yeah, season one ended in 2017. So you know we're on season two because because in that in that last episode in that finale when Michael's true nature is revealed, then it's also then then you get the sense of how good of an antagonist he was because he has everybody fooled and mm-hmm. i i really love at the reveal when when eleanor figures it out and he responds with that evil laugh <laughs> <laughs> it's, right? it's almost like a giggle it's almost like, like a, a giggle mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's like pitch perfect right <laughs> it's like it's pitch perfect evil and then and 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 then he just wipes her memory and subjects them to that torture over and over again, wiping their memories every time Eleanor figures it out, which she always eventually does. Um, <laughs> but he was he was seriously in consideration for me as well. But but the best I, antagonist, yeah. But again, when he, when he reveals his true stripes, Michael Danson or Ted Danson again, pitch perfect. It does 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 evil pitch perfect so <laughs> definitely maybe not the best antagonist but but the antagonist i most enjoyed in 2017 it, it was it, it was highly in consideration for me as well i also kind of wanted to bring up a runner-up i had which is aubrey plaza as yes. lenny and legion i could i could have also uh placed her but then I, I I got to a point where I felt like I was giving Legion everything, <laughs> every every award in the book. Like yeah, so I was like, I I just I gotta mix this up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Aubrey Plaza was great in the role that was originally meant for a man. And yes. uh, he went in for a male casting role. And then they said, Hey, do you want us to like rewrite this? We're going to work on rewriting this role for you. And she was like, no, don't just, yes. just let me play just it exactly let, as it's written. Yeah. Let, let her play it as a man. And it works because, because while the character is male, like the character is still a male in the, in the show. But since, since the character exists inside of legion's mind he can manifest himself in any form he chooses and he chooses the form of aubrey plaza yeah yeah and it's great and and it's a kind of a slow reveal towards the sinister nature of the character and then it's because when it starts off it's like she works great as a wingman you know kind of like in this like figure of this buddy of his and then as it goes on and you start to get into like oh okay there's some sinister sides to it okay he's like this bad influence on him then it's like oh no he's this villain on him and all of those pieces are part of the same it's kind of slowly revealed yeah because at first yeah at first she come you know comes off as his friend right and 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 well at first like he's in the the mental hospital he and she's like a fellow inmate and they get buddy buddy and you think oh you know she she's his friend you know his fellow inmate that they're friends with and it's slowly revealed her nature is slowly revealed through the episodes Mm mm-hmm it's like until until ultimately you realize what she is and that she's the ultimate antagonist of the show. <laughs> and, then, and then once that's revealed, they just go full on out with just like her reveling in being the evil villain of the show. Yes. Like, I mean, we're talking about dance numbers and Technicolor, I like <laughs> divided Technicolor fashion. We're talking like starts wearing like a pantsuit with like crazy hair to like really go to full fact. And just kind of takes the spotlight. Yeah, she just takes the spotlight, and it it's a fantastic performance. It's and it's one of the most m- memorable villains of 2017 for sure. Mm-hmm. And as an interesting character as she is, and she was on my list for for this award as well. We're gonna move on to most interesting character. Ah, so yeah. I'll kick things off. Um, I'm gonna say Tom Hardy as James Kazaya Delaney and Taboo. You gave him best protagonist. I'm giving him most interesting character which is um, fair. yeah cuz every because time he's on he's on scene i just want my eyes are glued to him right because you want to know what he's going to do yeah i, right. I want to see what he 
he's going to do. I, I, I don't know what he's going to do. I want to see what's going to happen. I, I, so I'm glued to him for that reason. But I also like, I want to know more about him. You know, I want to right. know right. He, like he, what shaped him this way. And he, he's, he's a bit mysterious and unpredictable. Yeah. Right? So yeah, he's very interesting for those reasons. But we already talked about him a lot. So <laughs> we'll go to your choice now. Well, my choice is obviously Mr. Wednesday, because again, it, it for, for basically the same reasons you picked Delaney, because Mr. Wednesday is mysterious. Um, you don't really know what he's about, what he's going to do. Yeah, very he, much the same, actually. He's mysterious. He's intimidating. He draws your eyes to him at all times. He's on screen. You don't know what he's going to do when he is on screen. Yeah. Um, and you want to know more about him, because again, you, I mean, you figure out right away that he's Odin. Yeah. But, but, but <laughs> There's so some what? pretty big clues. <laughs> But but so what? That still doesn't tell you much about him, you know, or his motives or what, you know, or what his goals are. The only thing you know is what he states and you don't know if what he's saying is truthful or not. Or even like what level of truth. Or what level of truth. You don't know. how. Uh, one of the things about Mr. Wednesday is you don't know how much you can trust him. And I don't think that as far as trust goes, I don't think you can trust him very much. Yeah. You know, um, it's just that way. So, so you're kind Kind of every time he's on screen, you're kind of hoping to learn more, you know, or or to or to try and suss out what his true motives are, you know, why, you know, why he's doing what he's doing, mm -hmm. and where what he's doing aligns with what the other characters have in mind. Right, exactly. You know, why did he why did he recruit Shadow Moon? Uh, what's what's so important about Shadow Moon? Because we find out they basically engineered the the events that brought Shadow Moon to him in the first mm -hmm. place. So there's something special about him. We don't know what that is. Only Mr. Wednesday knows, and he's keeping that a closely guarded secret. Um, so very, yeah, very interesting character. Next up, we have best action scene or fight. And again, we picked the exact same one, which is the loot train scene from Game of Thrones. This is yes. the scene in which the Lannister army has conquered Highgarden, and they're taking their loot back to uh, uh, King's Landing. And they got their, their horse and their soldiers and they got the cargo and they're taking it down. And then they hear this rumbling. Yes. And I think what's so brilliant about the, the way that this episode or the scene is handled is that it's all done from the perspective of the Lannisters, of, of Jamie. And so what ends up happening, of course, is that this is Daenerys' forces attacking him. Starts with the Dothraki, but then the dragon comes in, Drogon comes in and starts just roasting the field and just taking out scores of, of their forces. Just completely decimates their entire forces on that plane. And it's it's amazing to see and behold. It's, it's that moment where you're like, finally, the dragons have become of use. They've, they've come right. in and done finally, something, you know? The dragons have come in and done something. You know, there's there's a lot of tense moments within that scene, you know. Bron, I think what really makes it work, though, is that you're getting it all from, like, Jamie's perspective. You're getting it, yeah. Bronn gets... And gets Jamie and Bronn, you don't fully believe that the, any of the was real and now all of a sudden here's like tens of thousands of Dothraki standing yeah. on their horses and shooting arrows and just like obliterating their forces just and you know and I was like a knife through hot butter and then a dragon I, I had the feeling that Bronn was going to bite it in that yeah. scene because because I, I just really felt like they were setting it up to kill off Bronn mm -hmm. uh, tur turned out not to be the case he he actually puts a big ass uh, freaking arrow into Daenerys dragon which leads to Jamie Jamie thinking he has an opening to take out Daenerys and almost getting himself killed in the process yeah uh, be because only being saved by Bronn when Bronn realizes that Jamie is not thinking and is just rushing headlong to his death <laughs> yeah. again you know? I think there, there's two things that make this work one is the the, the amount of work that went into the, the scene itself I mean the, the combination of digital and practical effects and the amount of work they put in and how just amazing it looks. But more than that, even is what I said before, is that it's all this is all from Jamie's perspective. Yeah. This is Jamie and his band, and they're traveling back to King's Landing and they're victorious and they've taken 
taken out High Garden, and now they're on their way back, and then just utter devastation hits them, <laughs> and and it's amazing. It is amazing. It is a great scene. Yeah, uh, it's, it's I, one of those scenes. A, I mean, I watched it with a group, and people were standing up <laughs> you know, as it happened. I, I was reading comments on the internet, and most people were complaining about how Daenerys managed to teleport there with her magical teleporter, and I'm just like rolling my eyes. <laughs> That's been that. It's the Westeros mass transit system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it it's was been happening all season. People complain about it, but hey, you know, if we didn't have it, then we wouldn't have these amazing scenes. Right, exactly. So I can overlook the timeline, you know, because yeah, people apparently want to watch the boring parts in between where Daenerys spends an hour flying to the location. So next up, we're going to do funniest scene. So I'm going to let you go first. Uh, mine was, uh, the boobs in California song from, uh, Kimmy Schmidt. Um, this was a great, this was a great setup, uh, because we have, uh, Titus Andromedon. He, he, he takes up this odd job through that he, that he picked up through a telephone app where he's, he's singing, he's singing lyrics for, uh, the songwriter. And it's all, it's all politically questionable stuff. It's a bit racist, a bit it's a, misogynist. It's a bit racist, misogynist, and you, you know, you would think. Oh, and, homophobic. And, <laughs> yeah, homophobic. And yet none of this bothers Titus in the least. He, he, he goes out there and he sings it and he sings it with aplomb and, you know, he doesn't seem disturbed by it, you know, and then, and then finally he's handed a song that does disturb him that rocks him to his core that that he's questioning whether or not he can do it you know he, he has a crisis about it and they don't tell you what this song is of course you you've heard the other stuff and you're like thinking god god if 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 that stuff wasn't you know this must be really bad right so when when he finally decides to go through with it and sing the song and it, it's a song about boobs <laughs> <laughs> That's what's got him so worked up. He has to he has to sing about loving boobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most ridiculous song. They do a, like a music video for it and like everything. As funny yeah. as the setup is, it's equally just as funny seeing somebody as out there flamboyantly gay as Titus. As Titus. Talk, singing about how much he loves boobs in singing California. About, yeah, that's what makes it, right? <laughs> He's got like this ridiculous wig on and like the freaking music video and I was just dying. I was like, holy shit. And then when he gets done singing it, he has to like puke in a bucket. <laughs> that, was, that was actually my runner-up that that came like very close to winning for funniest scene and was probably my funniest scene pick until i watched american vandal oh and one yeah, scene took american it for me vandal. with american vandal and it was the hand job investigation scene oh my god yep <laughs> where they were trying to figure out if this one character who had bragged about getting a hand job from a popular girl if there was any any white way that somebody could have seen it and given proof and they're using like CG models of a figure on a dock getting a hand job from another CG model oh <laughs> and they keep God. showing it and they're handling it so seriously and every time they cut and show a different angle like and it's it's the whole series is a spoof basically of like true crime documentaries right so yeah. it's it's handled exactly that same way but each time they cut with the serious music and the serious tone and the talk about <laughs> evidence and the importance of this moment in this direction and then you see this like you know cg equivalent of like a stick figure giving a hand job <laughs> to another stick figure on a dot i you just you can't stop bursting out laughing laughing oh my at God, it, it's so stupid <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny though yeah it, it's it's uh it has to be the, the funniest scene in, in a great series Definitely. And that's my, my pick for funniest scene. Uh, let's go on now to saddest scene. And this is one that I just changed and updated for an episode that I watched last night, an episode of Black Mirror. We talked about watching it and for contention on, t and on this list. Yes. And so my pick is from the episode Crocodile of Black Mirror. And it's the scene in which we have a female character who's in, an investigator, like for insurance companies. And she, she has has this technology that allows her to kind of kind of triangulate through different people's perspectives um, and figure out like what happened in a scene. And so using this technology, she ends up seeing more than
than she intended to and now is being basically tied down and and held by this woman who's killed several people um and is trying to protect herself that's why she's killing she's not like a you know a, um a serial killer or something she's killing just to basically keep well, she basically is at that point well yeah. but she's she's doing it for a reason she's doing it to try to keep herself you know to cover her tracks this is the whole thing you know but while she's she's doing that she says does anybody else know you're here? And, and the investigator's like, no, no. And she's begging, no. And she's crying, you can know. And, and we've seen that she has like a husband. So you're like, oh no, she's trying to protect her husband. Um, but they use this technology. Uh, she uses this technology against her, her own technology against her, which is what makes it heartbreaking because she knows how it works and that she's screwed at this point ends up discovering the face of, of her husband and, and her house and goes off to kill them and then kills her. And so this woman now, she dies knowing that, you know, her she just gave up her husband. Mm-hmm, but sure. when she arrives at the house and she kills the husband, which is brutal, by the way. I mean, she ends up hitting the husband in the head with like a hammer like twice. It's very brutal. It's it's sad. And he doesn't really kind of see it coming till it's too late. And then it, it's just, he sinks, slinks into the bathtub. She's getting ready to go. She's taken off her mask that she was wearing and now she's like okay I've taken care of this I'm done as she's walking out she hears a baby crying Mm -hmm, sure and because of this technology they can bring up memories of things that they've seen and that means this baby even though it's a baby that can't communicate is a witness Mm -hmm, sure and so she she kills the baby and we find out quickly after that it didn't matter because the baby was blind and and it's just it's heartbreaking because it's like god this just this whole family is just destroyed because this one woman trying to cover it up and and it d- doesn't even work for her in the end anyways because they quickly show you like when the police are there after they mention the baby being blind you see that they've got another one of those cameras hooked up to a a, a hamster to view to get the same amount of information the episode ends with police officers entering the back of this like school play that her kids in so it was all for naught this whole family was wiped out for nothing and so my set of scene was a uh, bob died in Stranger Things. Yeah. This, this, like, up until the point at which this, uh, I watched that Black Mirror episode, this was my pick. So my pick was Bob was, Bob was a good addition to the second season of Stranger Things. I thought, uh, Sean Astin really played a lovable, affable guy, you know, um, and, you know, he, he gets himself in this situation there in, there in the institute, you know, and, and it's being overrun by the creatures from the upside down. Uh, the demo dogs. <laughs> the, the demo, go- demo dogs. Yeah, demo dogs. Uh, the, it's overrun and they're trying to escape. Bob's trying to escape and he almost makes it. He gets like so close, right? He, 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 he makes it to joy. And, and it's, and it's so sad because he, he, the demo dogs, he stops, right? Cause he's so happy to see her. And that seals his fate because the demo dogs break through and they murder him in front of her, which makes it all the more sad, right? Because she's standing right there when he's killed, you know, and she's screaming and it, and, uh, it just sucked. It just sucked. Yeah. It's right? made particularly worse by the fact that Bob was kind of a doofus at the beginning. And right. then not too many episodes before the scene, we, we start to find out that Bob is actually like quite competent and ends up helping them quite a bit. Ends up helping them. They did, like again, the Duffer Bird, they do a good job with characterization in this show. Like they turned, they turned Bob from somebody who, who could have easily been annoying. And this, this also was down to Sean Astin's performance as well. You gotta give Sean Astin credit for this too. There are a few more lovable actors. <laughs> yeah. He, he went from a character who who could have been like super annoying to like by the time he is killed you actually you actually you know came to love him yeah which again which which makes the scene work you know the duffer brothers know what they're doing <laughs> you know you know they so they it could have easily been like oh well he was annoying anyway who cares but no you you cared for genuinely cared for bob at that point at least you know if, if you had a soul you can you cared for bob at that point when he died so that so that made for a sad scene so that made that was my pick for saddest scene 
Next up, we have most tense scene. So I'm going to let you kick things off here. Oh, yeah, that was the scene in American Gods where uh Mr. Wednesday and Shadow Moon are in the police station, right? And all of a sudden, Mr. World and his cohorts show up, and he confronts Mr. Wednesday. And it's pretty tense because you don't know what's going to happen. Mr. World, basically, he's approaching Wednesday. He's offering a truce, right? He, he doesn't want... He, he doesn't want to war with Mr. Wednesday, apparently. He wants Wednesday on his side, and he even and he even makes him an offer on how, you know, he, he can make Wednesday or Odin powerful again. God of North Korea. <laughs> yeah, the God of North Korea, right? The Odin missile, right? Uh, Mr. Wednesday rejects the offer in not the most polite way, and, you know, basically tells him to go fuck off. <laughs> you know? And, and it's very tense because because you don't know, like, is shit going to break out into, like, an all-out fight in that police station? You know? It seems it certainly seems like Mr. Wednesday is itching for a fight right then and there. Yeah, right? and he doesn't <laughs> hold back on his insults to Mr. Rowan. He, He's not being cordial. <laughs> yeah, he is not being cordial at all. He's whereas, spitting fighting words. <laughs> whereas, you know, you can tell Mr. World is trying his best to be cordial. <laughs> but his fighting words, like, hey, he wants a fight. Um, and it's an encounter between two great actors that always can make a scene tense. Yes. We talked last year about the scene between Ed Harris and uh, um, Anthony Hopkins in Westworld being like a really powerful scene between two huge characters, you know, two, two huge actors. Same thing here, Mr. World, Ian McShane, or Mr. Wednesday, Ian McShane, Mr. World, Crispin Glover. Yes. So that was a great scene, I thought. Uh, my pick for most tense scene was the episode after the one take episode or the, the simulated one take episode of Mr. Robot, which was tense by design. I mean, when you do a, um, one take episode, you're doing it for tension. And so that episode was super tense because of that, but it was the next episode that kind of went the other direction and had like tons of cuts and tons of quick edits. And that was the episode that was more tense for me where Elliot was trying to stop this plan to blow up these buildings well at the oh, time he thought right. building that entire episode was tense as hell yeah but but just the the trying to stop the plan to blow up this building ended up being multiple buildings but he was yeah. fixated you on this one that, building you don't find that out until the end of the episode that yeah it's like the gut punch waiting for you at the end of that episode after 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 all that tension right after he seemingly succeeds and that tension is relieved it, you know it's funny because the tensions relieved and then they punch you right in the gut as soon as as, <laughs> as soon as they let you breathe right and you could just you could just start to see the vague <laughs> ideas that something else was afoot yeah. because he's walking and he's narrating to himself about how he was able to stop this building from up and as he's doing it you're noticing all these people grouped around shop windows um, looking at their phones like you know you, you, this focus that something clearly happened and Elliot slowly starts to become aware of it and that's when the gut punch hits mm, yes but yeah, so the scene in particular I'm talking about from that episode that I found super tense was Elliot trying to stop, tr trying to, to basically stay in this building as Mr. Robot is doing just the opposite. And so Elliot keeps losing time, keeps like showing up blocks away or like in the elevator to go back and he's heading back and he's trying so hard to get there. And it's a little bit reminiscent of Fight Club and the scenes where you see like, uh, um, like Tyler and, and, uh, um, and the narrator like fighting each other as as he's trying to stop Tyler's plan mm -hmm, sure. in the parking garage. You know, it's, it's similar to that, but it, it's just the, the tension of, 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 of Elliot trying so hard to stop this plan from happening, trying to trying to get through to Mr. Robot that, that Mr. Robot's being used, trying to convey all of that. That's uh, It was such a tense scene. Like you said, it ends, the episode ends with like a gut punch. Yeah. Next up, we have most shocking scene. I'll start things off here, and and my pick for most shocking scene is basically an entire episode, okay. and that is uh, Twin Peaks Returns Part Eight. Oh, right. <laughs> I wouldn't say that shocking. Uh, it different. <laughs> it's it shocking be, that, that I was watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was watching. As I was watching. It was definitely uh, it was, it was definitely the most interesting uh, episode of 2017. 
thing, right? Yeah. Uh, because I it mean, was, there's like basically like a, a little bit of plot that starts things off, then a full Nine Inch Nails performance. Yes. And, and then, then like a 10 minute slow zoom into a nuclear explosion. It was basically it was basically a mini art film. Yeah. Inserted into the middle of the season. That I don't that that seems like even after the fact seems seems like only tangentially related to the rest of the season. Yeah. But and that's what was shocking to me, is because it was yeah. like it kind of came out of nowhere. It did come out of nowhere. It really <laughs> did. It was very David Lynch as most experimental. Um and, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic yeah. for it. And it, it's one of those things that sticks with you and you digest it over a very long period of time. Because yeah. like we finished it and we were like, how do we even talk about this? But then right. as days went by, we ended up actually having a lot to talk about. Well, in that yeah. Episode. As you start to, to, to digest it and to start to get the relevance of stuff that's happening in it. Yeah. Well, because we thought, how you talk about it? Because it wasn't structured like, like a normal episode of television. It wasn't, I didn't even have like a set narrative structure, right? Yeah. It was just a bunch of surrealistic images and things happening back to back. You know, it, it it wasn't so much, it wasn't even like so much a narrative as it was just like, the best way I could describe it is like a dream. Yeah, just a surrealistic art house project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now your pick for most shocking scene was actually one that I remember last year when we were making our list. I had just watched this episode mm. and we were making this list, but the problem was is that this episode, we were making the list in 2017, talking about 2016 so i couldn't include it in the list but it's like all i could think about was this episode <laughs> and i'm like oh, how do i how do i not include this episode in, for this category of most shocking scene and i'm like well because it, what didn't happen this year i can't include it right exactly um, this year has come and now you've included it so fill everybody in yeah so i i i did what you desperately wanted to do last year and that was <laughs> the season finale of season one of the good place where we find out that the title of the show lied to you. It's not the good place. It's the bad place. In fact, they've been in the bad place the entire time. And that's when Michael is revealed to be the antagonist, by the way. The aforementioned. Yeah. So there have been other awards here that have basically won on the conceit of this twist. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and what makes this twist so great is, is that you do genuinely don't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Even though, like, now it seems obvious. Oh, yeah. If you go back and look the clues are there it's all present. Well, well, that, well that's what makes it a good twist too is that the clues are all there when you go back and look earlier in the season it's not one of these things it's not like one of these twists where like they do the twist and then they desperately try to justify it by retconning as much as they can about what came previously <laughs> no not which, at all which, yeah. which a lot of bad writers do because you know they, they 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 have to insert a twist somewhere and then they realize well this doesn't make any sense so let me just have characters explain why they acted contrary in in such you know no it doesn't <laughs> be, because when the twist happens Ted Danson doesn't sure Ted Danson has to justify why why he pretended it was the good place I guess right mm -hmm. but 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 his justifications for why for for why he wants what did what he did fits thematically with what they're doing because then you realize that the show is really a deconstruction of sitcoms the sitcom mm -hmm. genre itself and again if you go back earlier in the season there's a reference to that where you know michael mentions that he is addicted to the show friends yeah and, and then when you think about that you think oh that's how he got the idea for the good place in the first place <laughs> <laughs> even, even beyond that i mean the show is like a deconstruction of like altruism yeah like what it means to be good and this is like a thread that's put through the series as as Chris and Bell's character is trying to be good so that she can fit into the good place or what she thinks right. is the good place. But that theme continues like even stronger into season two after this twist. Well, what what's interesting is, right, the first season treats Kristen, Kristen Bell's character as the main character of the series. She 
she is the main protagonist. Season two cast Michael as the main protagonist of the series. Mm-hmm. In a way, it's really interesting how they kind of flip how how they kind of flip the perspectives like that. Again, this show is you find out very quickly that this show isn't straight. It's full of twists and full of new surprises constantly, and that's why I like about this show. That's that's always surprising you at every corner. I actually listened to an interview with uh, the showrunner of the series, Mike Schur, and he said that the This Is The Bad Place moment was his pitch for the show. Oh, really? Yeah. The, 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 the entire pitch of the show was that this was going to happen. Another clue, another not another subtle clue, too, is the fact that there's so many frozen yogurt places. Yeah. I think some people figured out uh, that frozen yogurt is a type of thing people think they love, but really you would... You pre- eat it because it's a healthier version of something you really love yeah it's a healthier version of something you really love when pe- people trick themselves in thinking they love frozen yogurt when they really want ice cream yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a, definitely a, a very clever show and that twist like when that happened you know we were making our list for our 2016 best of tv and and oh it was so hard not to include it like i'm like can i just like fit it in because it was part of that you know it's part of the first season and the first season started 2016 and i'm like no it didn't air in 2016 doesn't make sense nope. so yeah i'm so glad we were able to talk about it in this one so our next category is most satisfying scene and uh, I'll go first here and I'll say that my most satisfying scene of the year actually was the very first scene in this season of Game of Thrones. Hmm. And that's Arya taking out the entirety of House Frey. Oh, I should have made in that. Honey Foul Swoop. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot about that. Damn. <laughs> uh, just like being able, like seeing that scene start with Walter Frey and it's like, wait a minute, is he, is, is this like a flashback? Like what's yeah. going on? And then as you start to realize that it's not a flashback, then you're like, oh shit, that's Arya. I guess. And then I, I when you're like, that. that's Arya, then you see them like, you know, doing the cheer and telling everybody to eat up and you're like you know what's happening and it's being revealed as you know as like the 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 uh, um the details of what you know is happening you know they, it, it all starts to kind of come together at the same time like it's like it, it starts to clarify in your head the consequences of, of what's happening as it's unfolding in front of you right and it makes it so satisfying when they just they're just all dead and then she starts walking through their corpses and she turns to one of walter Frey's like like child brides and is like telling him, you know, let let everybody know that winter came for you know uh, for House Frey. You know, in retrospect, I am going to agree with you. That is the most satisfying scene of 2017. That is justice for the Red Wedding, which we've been waiting literally years for retribution for that. Three uh, years, yeah. Three years, because that because to most people watching Game of Thrones, the Red Wedding was such a jarring event, such a scarring event, you know, and it seemed like Walder Frey was just going to get away with it. And that was it. And in the novels, you know, the novels, they had a character who, who, who basically got vengeance for that. Mm-hmm. But this character didn't appear in the show at all. So, yeah. it, so it looked like for a long time, it looked like nothing was going to happen with that. Well, now, well, well last now, season we got justice on Walter Frey. Yeah. But this, what was amazing is that, that, that wasn't the end of it. That's what made it so amazing. Yeah, that's what made it so amazing. Yeah, exactly. That wasn't the end of it. This, this was the end of it because the rest of House Frey, like Arya single handedly killed off the house fray the entirety of house fray as revenge for the death of her brother and her mother yeah um it was and it was amazing and aria is my a favorite true, character in the series yeah. <laughs> aria is a true badass <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah. so great is like the second that scene ended, I turned to like everybody I was watching with and we throw Game of Thrones parties and this was the season premiere. So we had like everyone there and I turned, I was looking at everybody and I'm like, they're going to sing songs about this. This yeah. is like, you know, like the reigns of Castamere being about like Tywin Lannister, like destroying oh. a house. Well, like now Arya's done it, you know? You know now Arya's done it. So they got to sing songs about her, right? Except nobody, yeah. knows, nobody knows Arya did that because well, she that's, was Well, there's some women there that saw you know That's like the true. walter's child bride that watched watched walter take his face off <laughs> you're right <laughs> so there's gonna be there's gonna be songs about this and it's i hope that like in the next season we have 
a scene where we see like in the background some soldiers singing a song about Arya destroying House Rey. <laughs> like maybe not even knowing that it's Arya, like calling her the ghost of the twins or something, or you know, like but that, that's like kind of my hope going into that. Maybe maybe Ed Sheeran can come back for that. <laughs> <laughs> So your original pick for most satisfying scenes before you changed your mind right here was another <laughs> scene from Game of Thrones. Okay, yeah, if we got to bring that up. Yeah, it was I I basically picked this just because I just because I didn't know what to pick for this and it was kind of a heat of a moment, but this was the scene where where like Jon Snow and his cohorts got basically trapped by the whites by the white walkers and the whites and it looked like they were going to die and then Daenerys comes flying in with her dragons and she kills and and she saves them basically she loses one of her dragons in the process and it's very sad but she saves Jon Snow and his friends from certain deaths um and it was a very cool scene um it was definitely very satisfying when she flew in with those dragons definitely uh but I completely forgotten about this the scene with Arya at the beginning of season and when you brought that up I I had to change it because uh Arya getting revenge for the red wedding is ultimately way more satisfying and and besides we already put something on this list involving Daenerys and her dragons you know I'm, it's kind of redundant to have that <laughs> on there again <laughs> so, but yeah that was my original choice so I had a runner up on here as well which was from the show Better Call Saul which is about Saul Goodman it's the prequel about Saul Goodman becoming Saul Goodman from like his, yeah. you know, Jimmy McGill is who, is who he really is. And um, there's been for a while now in the last season and this season, you found out like just how much of an asshole his brother is and how his brother has basically just been, you know, his brother doesn't trust him. And because he doesn't trust him, he undermines everything he does in mm-hmm. like a really cruel way where he and he's kept it like secret, too. So it's like Jimmy just thinks his life is always falling apart and he doesn't realize that it's his brother basically engineering it. Right. And it, it became so bad that like there, a subreddit was started called Fuck Chuck because <laughs> Chuck is yeah. his brother and people hated him so much for that. Well, Jimmy got a bit of comeuppance on his brother in a scene in um, Better Call Saul. He kind of outfoxed his brother uh, on a few occasions. There was some back and forth, but there was one really good one where he just completely humiliated his brother. Oh, wow. And it was glorious. <laughs> <laughs> because after everything his brother had done and it, and it was hard for Jimmy to do too because he still kind of loved his brother and couldn't, was having trouble doing it but when he did it it's just that moment of comeuppance it was just lovely and I remember jumping on Reddit and just seeing applause everywhere <laughs> so it was, it was a satisfying moment but uh, our next four categories aren't about shows specifically but about the sources of shows and, and who we think has been doing kind of the best job as far as providing shows based on, you know, the categories of network, um, cable channel, premium tier cable channel, that being like an HBO or Cinemax Star or something like that, or a streaming service like Netflix. So network is meaning the channels that are provided free over the air in America, those being CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, and the CW. And I just want to quickly cycle through these because not not too much interesting to say. But I picked for network, I picked NBC. Surprise, I know, right? Uh, but <laughs> the good I, place. <laughs> I, I felt the good place is a fantastic comedy, you know, and I've, I've complained about past seasons where NBC had, had faltered on the comedy point. Mm-hmm. And I still don't think they're there if the good place is like their only good comedy, but the good place is so good. Who cares? I love that show. They, they have a few others. So they had, they had another one that was coming up as, as a runner up in another category for me, but. Oh, I have, um, no, I have no idea what the hell else is on that network. <laughs> NBC right was one of the ones I was heavily considering, but I ended up giving it to Fox just because of the combination of, of their new comedies and dramas. Um, the Orville being a, a pretty good Star Trek clone. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the Gifted being a really good like X-Men series that's just progressively gotten better as it's gotten into like Hellfire Club type stuff. Fair. And uh, um, Ghosted being a good comedy. And then you have, you know, The Mick and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Last Man on Earth still killing it in the comedy side. So uh, from, from the years before. Cable, obvious, obviously I picked FX. I mean, same on, here. Taboo and Legion. I mean, yeah, and Fargo. And Fargo. Taboo and Legion as new shows and a new season 
season, a great season of Fargo. Yeah. Uh, with how, how many, how many times we mentioned those three shows during this podcast, how could it not be FX? Right. Yeah. FX killed it. <laughs> yeah. FX killed it as streaming Netflix. Um, what can you say? They have stranger things. No competition had, really. Amazon and, and Hulu both did some pretty good stuff, but come on. But come on. Yeah. They, stranger things, the Punisher, Black Mirror, Mindhunter, Orange is New Black, Castlevania, Glow, American Vandal, Big Mouth. It's unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. It's just, it's like endless. <laughs> like endless. They're investing so much in new series and a lot of them, a lot of them are great. You know, I think Netflix is probably going to continue to win this award yearly if they keep if they keep this up <laughs> amazon and hulu are competing they're, they're they're amazon and hulu right now like what they're putting out would have beaten netflix maybe like three four years ago yeah not current netflix, netflix <laughs> but they're just netflix is too far ahead of the curve um, uh, on a premium tier cable uh i chose hbo mostly because of game of thrones but also silicon valley and they brought back curb your enthusiasm mm-hmm. but mostly because of game of thrones i haven't watched there really it. wasn't a lot of new on HBO this year. Yeah, there wasn't. And that's why I didn't pick HBO for this year because I realized the only thing I watched on HBO this year was Game of Thrones and giving it to HBO for Game of Thrones is just, that's passe, especially in a year when stars took a huge risk and put out American Gods, which is a brand new show, which is a very risky show. Um, I think all the premium networks really need to step up their game there. They really do. But I really thought stars st- stepped up to the plate with American Gods because you know, uh, it it turned out to be so good. Mm-hmm. Brand new show, risky concept. You know, um, they could have easily they could easily watered it down, or <laughs> you know, or you know what they let Brian Fuller and crew go wild on that. And what can what can I say? It's some it consider- was a winner. <laughs> some consideration can also be given to Showtime, who um, I normally I, I've kind of fallen out of love with Showtime over the last couple of years because right. it's just going it, it's. Just just not in a direction I've really enjoyed that much, but this year they did bring back Twin Peaks. Yeah, consideration for Twin Peaks. You definitely gotta give Showtime kudos for bringing back Twin Peaks and basically letting again, laying an auteur like David Lynch do his thing and basically getting out of his way. Part even, 8, that's all even, I can say. Even if it didn't really pay off for Showtime as much as they hoped. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think the investment was, was that strong for them, because it didn't because it people were talking about Twin Peaks, they weren't talking about Twin Peaks on Showtime, right? Um, right exactly. So, I don't think it really gave them the kind of boost that they were hoping for. I mean, Twin Peaks was in discussion, so it got that mind share, but people were just talking about Twin Peaks, they weren't talking about. I think, I think one problem series. was that Twin Peaks was also available on streaming, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah, I don't know. That's so, it. Yeah. Uh, now we have our top awards. Let's start with, uh, best comedy. Mm-hmm. So we picked the same one here, which is The Good Place. Um, yeah. we don't need to dwell on it too much. We've talked about how brilliant the show is. We've talked about the concept. We talked about the big twist. It's great. <laughs> my runner up would be Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Uh, this season was as brilliant as the last seasons. Uh, mm-hmm. that show continues to be brilliant as well. I'd say it's probably better than the last season. I think so. Yeah, had had yeah. had more good moments. I thought uh, my runner-up on this category, I had one as well as Trial and Air. This is another show on NBC that was really good. Oh, I totally um, forgot. It didn't get as much show. attention, I think, as it deserved. I totally forgot about the show, but then again, I I only ever watched the premiere. Mm-hmm. I didn't watch any other episodes of that, so I don't think I could have. Real quickly, just to it. say without mm-hmm. going into the full thing, if you like like Parks and Recreation and just the idea of like a town full of eccentric, weird characters, mm-hmm. Trial and era is kind of like the successor to that yeah. it's just tons of eccentric weird characters and it that's where all the humor derives from so it was a good show i had that in my best comedy for a while but then i just said you know i can't not give it to the good place yeah good place it was just so too smart the way they, they did things in that show exactly um best drama i gave it to the leftovers which came to an end on its third season a brilliant end um a lot of people haven't seen the leftovers give it a shot if you want i think a lot of people have been kind of like burnt by Damon Lindelof with Lost, which is weird to me. 
always having to bring that up because I loved Lost for its entirety. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but some people were a bit burnt on that. If you do want to get into Leftovers, know that you're not really going to get answers for kind of anything. That's not what the show's about. But as I said in one of my award categories, you kind of do get answers in a way. You're just not sure if it's true or not. Um, I kind of, I, yeah, I kind of avoid Linda Lost's work for that reason because I, I, I since Lost, I've become wary about shows that 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 present a bunch of questions and kind of dick you around as far as answers go. Um. <laughs> Leftovers is so good, though. And yeah. in, in season two, it had this great twist. Season three, it just had these powerful monologues and stuff that just really sold that. Your uh, pick? My pick was Taboo. Uh, so many great dramas. Uh, this was the hardest one to pick, but since... I picked other shows for other categories. I thought I'd give this one to Taboo. Since this was a great drama, Tom Hardy was fantastic. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of good performances, a very strong story. Jonathan uh, Price was in it too from, uh, he was in Game of Thrones. He was great in it. He was great in it. Uh, just, just very well done show. Uh, looking forward to season two. Oh yeah, definitely. On this. Excited to see more, uh, Delaney. <laughs> yes. Now, best new series. I'm going to let you kick this one off. This was American Gods, easily. Uh, this was, for me, it, it was American Gods. I changed my mind at the last minute, oh, yeah. partially because I knew I gave some other awards to American Gods, and there was another show that I wanted to honor. But American Gods is definitely, it was really hard for me not to pick it. Uh, yeah, again, this was, again, American Gods, because I gave the other new show <laughs> this season a, a different award. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and that was uh, the award for best show overall. And I gave that I gave that to the other new show this season, uh, Legion was was my pick uh, for best show overall. So my pick for best new series, like I said, it was American Gods. I ended up having to change it um, just because this was another, this was a late series um, that I that I had to adjust everything for, and I just wanted to honor it because it's so good. What and that's it? Mindhunter. Okay, uh, I know my, nothing about this show. So Mindhunter <laughs> is a Netflix show. Um, it, it's basically about the birth of the BAU at the FBI. Oh, okay. So, so it's about like how they started like analyzing serial killers and oh, it's like it's like, ser- it's like criminal minds except it's 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 all about like it's not about cases it's not like case of the week it's like all about them going around on the road and interviewing real serial killers oh that's interesting so okay. so there's there's real serial killers. i say real but they're i mean there's actors playing them of course but they're <laughs> based on real people like ed kemper and they, they mentioned charles manson a few times they never interviewed him but they might be doing that for like season two um, that they wanted to interview him and stuff, but it, it's basically these two FBI agents and they're going around and they're interviewing people. But what's so fascinating is just how little thought was put into like how, what, how a serial killer's mind works mm-hmm. before this. Like it was just like, oh, they're evil or something. And it's like, well, yeah, that's a great position and all, but how does that help us catch them before they've committed a whole shitload of murders, you know? Right, exactly. And, and so this is about trying to figure out how they tick and it's just really smart. It's, the the whole series was directed by David Fincher Fight Club <laughs> uh, so it's it's really amazingly shot and stuff that portrayals of people like like Ed Kemper is a truly scary intimidating figure he's like 6'9 <laughs> he's this massive serial killer that did some unspeakably horrific things in his crimes not just the killing but just what he did was unspeakably horrific and but he's like has this desperate need to talk shop like he's talking to cops about you know cop work or something and it's just fascinating watching these FBI agents talking to these horrible people and trying to like flatter their egos or try to get them on edge by insulting them or just the different ways they're trying to get information from them or gleam information from them. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, I, I, I kind of described it to my mom, who's a huge Criminal Minds fan, uh, as uh, as being like Criminal Minds Origins. <laughs> <laughs> smart, smart. So yeah, so it, it's it's a good it's a good show. So that's that's I wanted to honor that. Um, I'd probably still say American Gods is a better show, but um, new series. But I really wanted to find somewhere I could squeeze Mindhunters in. Sure. 
So now we get the best show. You already mentioned yours, which is Legion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, how can it not be? It's amazing. I don't need to say anything more than that. <laughs> I went with the boring pick, <laughs> which is okay. Game of Thrones. Oh, boo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's Legion's great as well. Game of Thrones, it, it just continues to impress me, especially in the scale of the show year after year, yeah, how it just yeah. keeps getting bigger. Yeah, I, I love this season for a lot of reasons. Uh, pro- probably probably mainly stupid fanboy reasons like I I, re- I realize that the season narratively and structurally has its flaws and people have certainly bashed it for those flaws a lot uh, but that I, loot train <laughs> I yeah I mean I, I see a lot of criticism of this season of Game of Thrones a lot of people saying like this was the worst ever season of Game of Thrones um, <laughs> and I disagree and but then I realize my disagreement comes from the, just because the season has a lot of fanboy wish fulfillment you know that that you've been waiting the whole series to see people yeah I've been waiting the whole series to see you know Daenerys bust out the dragons against the Lannister army I've been waiting the whole series Jon Snow to meet Daenerys like all these kind of things That's yeah not, I've been waiting the whole series for the White Walkers to finally invade Westeros it's events seven seasons in the making yeah it's events seven seasons of making so and and also the, there's a zombie dragon yeah. how can you not love it <laughs> so yeah so that that's yeah. my best show just because of that and the sheer scope it's i understand you're you're getting drifting away from that as being like kind of the obvious choice and, and trying to kind of make room for other things but i just i i had to give it <laughs> yeah and i don't blame you <laughs> <laughs> and now under our special category so uh each year we we kind of create a category specific to us because it's something we want to talk about or mention. So I'm going to let you go first, Will. What was your um, special category want, in your pick? I actually want you to go first on this. Okay, so my special category is Biggest Surprise Series, and it goes to American Vandal. Mm-hmm. American Vandal is something that I described on the show before we started. I started watching it as being like, oh, it's like a spoof of true crime stuff, and it's like, oh, it looks pretty funny. Um, started watching it. It's like, yeah, it is that, it's, and it's funny. And then as you go on, you somehow get like really invested in the mystery as stupid as it is because it's just about vandalism it's not like this is a murder case you genuinely but you still do. get so hooked you genuinely do and my big disappointment in american vandal is that it ends so ambiguously like you 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 don't get that answer oh, that, and that just makes it more like a true crime series you 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 get the idea of an answer but yeah you're 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 left you're left with a sense of doubt if that's even correct but, so, i mean that's that's just makes it more like a true crime series because that's how they end you know because it's real yeah, life yeah cause this isn't real life but even still they're ending it like a true crime series so yeah it, it's just it's so good the mystery is so involving and the jokes in it are so funny i'll never look at the word hey with more than one y the same way again <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so many like little things from it that i just love oh, and, and oh, oh you and the ending you too didn't. has a lot of hearts you didn't know about the hey with more than one y thing before this that was something i was just blissfully unaware of but (laughs) but but yeah it's like i you know and like i said the the ending has a lot of heart too like it It starts getting into like it starts to explore like the consequences of this documentary there's there's some on these fictitious characters there's some real drama in this right yeah so there's the parts that are kind of heartbreaking towards the end you know as like everything starts to wrap up it's like oh well all this exposure has has negative side effects too and it starts going into that and then and it's just yeah it's really good so uh, that, that kind of took me by complete surprise i didn't had no idea i would like this show as much as i did my special category i'm going to try to avoid going on a full-on rant just save that <laughs> just save that for later a later we're going to talk about talk about it in about three weeks i think so yeah so i'm going to try to go avoid but i watched this uh this pissed me off so bad right and i watched this in 2018 and I got the idea for this category because I was just stewing about it and going, oh, you know, I'm going to make a worst of 2018 list next year. And this is going to be on my worst of 2018. And then I realized, wait, this, this actually came out in 2017. And December I, 29th. I can put, I, I, 
can put this on this list, and I will. <laughs> and that is our, my worst episode of 2017 because this whole because because we do, we do the best of right every year. We we don't do a worst of. And part of me wanted to do this because I, I find worst of lists interesting too, mm-hmm. just to see how just to see the stuff that went wrong. And for me, this was very wrong. Uh, this was uh, the worst episode of 2017 was uh, Black Mirror Crocodile. And long <laughs> story short, I hated this thing. It it, it made me extremely upset. Um, Tyson called it, you called it sad. Um, I, I, call, I call it rage-inducing. <laughs> because the plot is this woman, you know, is involved in in this accidental death, and then she just murders people throughout the episode to cover it up with zero consequences until, like, the last five seconds when you see police close in, but you don't get to see, like, anything after you. You'll actually get to see her suffer the consequences yeah. of what she's done, and, and it's just heartbreaking, rage-inducing. She she kills a baby at the end of it. And, you know, yeah. and I, I really wanted to see her go down for it. I didn't want to just see the police come into the auditorium and then have the credits roll, because that that's not satisfying. That's the block your way, though. And I'm just like, I, well, I, I, I left thinking, what, what was the point of that? What was the point? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Where, where was the irony? Where was the twist? Where was it? I don't know. What, what did I just watch? And I, I got to give it credit because. I don't think I've watched anything that's actually made me angry before. That That's new, right? <laughs> and it made yeah. me so angry I had to create this category and put this on there. <laughs> so <laughs> bravo, Black Mirror. <laughs> See, I actually quite like the episode just because I like when that's those are the kind of episodes I prefer on Black Mirror, the ones that really that are like, really bleak fuck with you. Yeah. <laughs> fuck with your emotions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean if you recall like when we talked about last season of Black Mirror, your favorite was San Junipero, the one with the kind of quasi happy ending. Right. I guess I'm and just my, stuck in my favorite was Shut Up and Dance, the one where it ends where you find out the protagonist was a pedophile all along. <laughs> <laughs> which which actually that that's not a bad episode I thought yeah. uh, because yeah this one was just like a woman murders a bunch of people and I don't know what was <laughs> the point I still don't know what the point of that was oh man <laughs> see I was I was in I enjoyed trying to look for the tech angle because you know it's a Black Mirror episode there's going to be a tech angle you know well yeah there so, was a tech angle with the memory device but it didn't seem to it it didn't seem like it was commenting on that tech at all or no it, it wasn't as much but it was interesting seeing how it worked and watching the net right. tighten around around this woman right you know because you could like like oh wow they're like triangulating memories and then you're like oh and then you could kind of see where it was going to go mm-hmm. and, and then you're like oh okay it's going to go this way and then when she becomes aware of it then it then it's like oh wow this might not go how we had hoped <laughs> yeah no it, it doesn't it doesn't go at all how you hope it was um with one episode left to go this is one of the dreariest hours of television I've ever watched. <laughs> and to me to me that's the stamp of approval for Black Mirror. <laughs> that's the stamp of I, I guess I yeah, did it I, I, I went to bed extremely angry and upset. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so yeah, we're um and part of what upset sets me is I, I can't find a message in this. I can't find a, a reason so yeah, I, I agree it was a little weak on that side of like, I mean, there is something about like the way technology can be turned against you and stuff, but, mm-hmm. but in general, it's, it's not as clever of, of a turn as, as we're used to in, in Black Mirror. Right. Exactly. But I do just like the, the kind of dreariness of like this net closing in on this woman and how she just loses it and just goes like completely. I mean, the title of the episode is kind of apt in Crocodile because crocodiles are cold blooded killers right that's and that's true. kind of what she becomes through the course of the episode she definitely becomes she 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 definitely becomes a cold blood killer you know when you're to a point where you'll murder a baby Definitely. You're gone. They, they, you're you're gone. You, you're you know that's irredeemable. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that episode in more detail and let let Will rant some more in, in about three weeks because, like I said, next week we're going to start talking about the magicians. 
Peaky Blinders and this season of Black Mirror. And this was the third episode of Black Mirror. So three weeks from now. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about some other Black Mirror ones leading up to that, starting off with the Star Trek esque episode, that which is interesting fun. just because it's like we've had so many Star Trek things on TV this year. Right. <laughs> I think may- maybe this was a reaction to that. Uh-huh. Yeah. So um, until then, though, here's what's coming up in the week ahead. Uh, on Friday, by the time this is available January 5th, 2018. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is back on the CW. And there's a new British series that actually looks really good coming to Netflix called The End of the Fucking World. And it looks really good. It's basically about this kid who's like a self-proclaimed sociopath. Like he thinks he's going to be a serial killer. And he's plotting to become a serial killer. And he becomes this girl, like inserts herself in his life. And he ends up like running around with her and getting in this crazy adventure with her. And the whole time he's thinking like, when am I going to kill her? But he's not sure really if he wants to <laughs> so it's just this kind of weird coming of age kind of show with this guy who thinks he's going to be a serial killer but probably isn't <laughs> he probably doesn't have that in him actually um then on saturday january 6 2018 falling water returns to usa on sunday january 7 2018 the golden globe awards air on nbc the shy which is about a bunch of people in chicago uh, comes to showtime and star trek discovery resumes it the second half of its first season on CBS All Access. We'll probably have a rant to talk about next week about how we still have to wait for the season to hit something else because CBS All Access is such a ripoff. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> then on Tuesday, January 9th, 2018, This Is Us returns to NBC. On Wednesday, January 10th, 2018, Alone Together debuts on Freeform. This is like Freeform shift towards like making stuff that's not just like teen drama. So this is like a, a comedy. Um, so we'll have to see how that turns out. And the Magicians debuts on Sci-Fi, and we'll be talking about that next week. Yes. And on Friday, January 12th, 2018, Blindspot returns to NBC, Taken returns to NBC, Disjointed returns to Netflix, and the Black Mirror competitor series, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams debuts on Amazon. Nice. So that'll be interesting. It, it, from everything I've seen, it doesn't look nearly as good as Black Mirror. <laughs> we'll have to see, though. Yeah. Uh, it's got some good people attached. Brian Cranston's involved, for example. But until then, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Tyson Gifford. You can reach Will. He is at Voxel Euro. You can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, as well as our site, tventhusiast.com. You can subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast client, like iTunes or Pocket Cast. And the entire backlog of our podcast is available on our YouTube channel. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And that's a wrap. Night. Night. If you would like to voice your opinion, send an email to the weekly set at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network. Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more coverage of all of your